live. And I guess we want to say welcome, everybody. Glad to have yep. you with us. Welcome back. Glad to have everyone back here with us. Um, good morning, good evening, whatever time of the day it is that you're joining us, uh, watching us, we're glad to have you. Uh, me and Stephen, we're continuing our journey through the book of John. I was joking with uh, Macy the other day. I said, you know, the way me and Stephen's going about this, we might be through with the book of John next year. Uh, but that's okay, you know. That is okay. Uh, so, again, you know, we're glad everyone's here. Uh, hope you're enjoying it. Hope you're had your Bibles ready. Uh, do you have anything you want to add or talk about, Stephen, before we get going? Nope. I'm just happy to uh, keep on going through. The Gospel of John. It's a good good study. All right. So I do believe we're supposed to be picking up what verse number nine? Fourteen. Fourteen. I yeah. thought I was wrong. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, no, we're we're in fourteen. I think we were gonna do fourteen through uh eighteen. Yeah today. I had, my, I had my um commentary in the right spot, but I had my my Bible app in the wrong place. That's what <laughs> me off. Nah, you're so, all uh, good. Yeah. You're yeah, just doing some background through, readings, are you doing? Yeah. So we're going to go through 14 through 18, and so this this will basically end up the, what the, the prologue of First uh, John. Uh, so, again, I'm reading from the New King James Version, and we're in uh, the first chapter of John, and we're beginning today in verse number 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, and the glory as as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Verse 16. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Man, I have learned and learned so much from this this little study me and you got going on, man. I have uh, I done a I practiced a little fifteen minute Devo last night with the girls uh on a subject and we're gonna we'll get into it once we, we kind of get into the text and back and forth but it was uh i've really enjoyed the study it gives a has a whole lot of content for us to really go after really oh yeah definitely go on all right so well i guess we're going to keep the same uh way we've been doing it go back and verse by verse um, yeah that's just yeah all right so, ver so verse 14 and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Do you want to go first, Stephen, or how are you going to do it? Oh, sure. Well, I guess, um, you know, when you look at the first phrase, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, is, uh, you know, you have a few different uh, very important words there. Uh, I'll see you have the word, the pre-incarnate Jesus, uh, who is seen as the word and John 1, 1 through 3, 1, 14. Then you go over to 1 John 1 uh, as well with the same uh, idea. And even uh, Revelation uh, 19, 17, I think it says he's called the word of life there. But uh, anyway, so you see that he became flesh or was made, as, as you read, uh, flesh. And so you see that this is a willing uh, transformation. Uh, he didn't just assume it, and then here it is. He, he, he willingly became flesh, and uh, and in doing so, he dwelt among us. And so that's the, the action, uh, you know, because flesh. And it, it's interesting here that he's emphasizing this part here that God is going to willfully leave the glories of heaven and dwell and reside among people give up all his power you know? mm -hmm. oh yeah yeah and uh it is interesting there that um uh, you know that if you look at um 
Cain and Abel back in Genesis 3, how God cursed Cain and said, because you've killed your brother Abel, uh, you're going to have to be a servant and you're going to have to till the ground and the ground's going to be cursed. Yeah. And I find it interesting here that that would um, establish kind of a precedent that, you know, the earth is, is a cursed place uh, all the way back from Cain and all the way back from Adam and Eve. And yet you have God coming in and uh, dwelling inside of that area to bring us out of that curse. Um, dealing with the curse of, of all the way back from the very beginning, from Genesis 3 with Adam and Eve and then Cain and Abel. And then brings all the way through. And so now you see this, um, this combining together right here. And then you see the imperative, but it says, and we beheld. That's the imperative. That shows that here it is. This is the command for you to do. It says, and you are commanded to behold his glory. Um, okay. So you see this uh, all all happening right here and I'll see the word glory there is where doxa uh, inside of the Greek and um, and, and you know it's, it's quite a bit of information about glory um, oh, yeah. you know and you, you know you have the other um, idea here of the tabernacle by dwelling among us yeah uh, so wow. that's where you're gonna go and then that's from uh, Ezekiel where uh, the glory left the tabernacle, and it's interesting here that from that standpoint, uh, now you have glory being beheld again through the tabernacle of the flesh of Jesus. Man, I, that's why I was mentioning, I've learned so much, and that verse 14, uh, that's where I was really yesterday, and I was looking at it, and I, you know, uh, man, this is a little, this is a little 10, 15 minute sermon, you know, a little deep, mm -hmm. deep though, right here, just that one word, well, you know, there's just so much packed into that. Um, and I really, uh, I, I like your point that you made. I didn't think about, I, I, didn't, I didn't think about how you uh, apply Cain and Abel and the earth being cursed and him coming to a cursed place. I, I, didn't, I didn't think about that. That's a good, that's a good uh, way to look at it too. Him coming here, um, God coming to earth to a cursed place. And I think that's one reason why the Greeks, and the Gentiles, he was a stumbling block to them, correct? Because they're, they're why would God come here and die? Correct. Uh -oh. And so, and but, so, and so, this this verse is really what you may call a redeeming verse of, you know, it's showing that He's going to redeem everyone back from the curse. Uh, Galatians three says curse of the law, but I think, you know, and by extension also it's dealing with the curse of of just humanity itself with sin. And then also, now you're going, now it, the other idea of redeeming there is how glory left the people of God, and now he's going to come back being the very person of glory. You know, 1 Corinthians 2 8 says he's the Lord of glory. Yeah. And so now he, he's redeeming, even by his very presence, he's here on a redemptive mission. So I, I, I really, really focus a lot on the well. All right, well, and tell I me what you I, got. I, before, I, before I get there, I do have a question to ask you. Have you ever heard of anyone saying uh, that Jesus was a phantom or that he was an illusion? He wasn't really here. Uh, because the idea of that word flesh that John really points out, and he became flesh, that it was a specific word he used to deny he was, he was actually human. And you've already referenced 1 John 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, you know, heard, they heard him, they seen mm -hmm. him, they looked upon him, they handled him, and there's many more verses that show that uh, he was thirsty, uh, he was tired, um, and think about when he was on the cross, he, he bled and he died. Mm -hmm. but have you ever talked to anyone that, that tried to claim uh, he was just a phantom or an illusion? Uh, not in person, no. The, the main thing I've heard more than anything else is he was just a good teacher and I, I've heard that a few times but I've never heard anything about him being a uh, an illusion or a phantom the, the co reason I asked that commentary had it in it and it's the people that believe this and I think it's died of it's called uh, Docetus 
D O C E T I S T S. I've yeah. never heard that. And I was like, well, I wonder if Stevens ever heard us or talked to someone of such. Um, I do know what the asceticism is, and that's the asceticism. <laughs> okay. Yeah, don't you? You're all good. Um, but um, yeah, and, and you know they're 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 a they're a um, an Eastern um, religion. There's a lot of them in China. Ah, uh, okay. Um, yeah, but but they but they they. Now I, I need to look at this up because this is kind of the thought me here. I'm pretty sure that they um, view the world in a very, very elementary way. You know, like they don't see it as being um, like like heaven and hell as part of reality. They, which which it is for everybody. You know, that's part of our reality. It's heaven and hell. But they they look at it from the standpoint of it's more of a just like a place of being yeah um and and so like like your ghost can't leave because it's place of being is here i i get what you're saying um i know that this there's a there's a few things around that um and so like there's not like an actual spiritual world waiting for us type thing it's all kind of here uh-huh. yeah Oh, right, well, that answers my question on that because I'd never heard of that until I read it. And I was like, hmm, anywho. So, my, the next word you kind of you, you talked about it, you know, that word the well, or he lived here, or I went with the way, you know, this way with it. You know, he pitched his tent. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's really what it means, a pitching a tent. Um, that tells me that he come here to not to stay forever, he was come here temporarily. He, um, he was camping. You know, he was just here camping. Uh, verse 1 says that um, says the word was, which existed eternally, and here it became flesh at a specific time, like a given point. That, that points you back to that first was made phrase mm-hmm. there, or you know, was made. Um, and Isaiah 7, 14, you know, predicted this. Now, that word, uh, skeno, or the word dwelt. I really like this. You know, in the Greek, that, that's what it was in the Greek. And then in the Septuagint, or the Old Testament, or LXX, whatever, how you want to say it, it was skin. That The word skin is what they used for tent, and that word was used frequently for the tabernacle. And the verb related to that word was used in reference to the uh, was used in the reference to the tabernacle where God dwelt among his people. And so I was like, man, that's, that's, that's pretty cool how all this fits together like a nice little mm-hmm. puzzle. So I, when, I, when I see it, I think John's trying to get uh, the idea across here to everyone that, uh, that Jesus is the place where God was dwelling here among you now. That, you know, if you want to see God if you want to have a relationship with God, you know you need to go to Jesus. That's where that's where He was. That's you know that's God was there. Jesus, He's dwelling inside Jesus. Mm-hmm. They're one and the same. Um, he is God's presence during that time period. So now I look at it, you know, as far as back then. That's what Jesus was. Jesus was God's dwelling place. They was he. They were in one. You know, they could sit in his lap. They could do all these things and you know, be with God, experience God, mm-hmm. see God. And so that's why I, that's why I kind of got to it. Them, they was able to see God. Well, if I want to apply that to us today, you know, how how does people see God today? Uh, well. Hebrews 9.11 talks about a greater and more perfect tabernacle, right? And that's referring to the church. All right, where there's plenty of scripture that talks about Jesus was a tabernacle, right? Uh, Revelation 21.3 uh, says Jesus, the tabernacle, or the tabernacle of God, it says, it is with men and he will dwell with them. God himself will be, will be with them. 
I mean, they, that's re referencing Jesus, you know, as the tabernacle. Um, so if the church in Hebrews 9 11 is called the more perfect tabernacle, well, aren't we, we are the church, the people make up the church. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you say? I mean, we are uh, that living tabernacle. We are the living stones of that tabernacle. And it's like I was explaining to uh, Gene and Abby last night. I said, you know, during Jesus' day, if people wanted to see God and experience God, they had that with Jesus. They seen God through Jesus. That was the whole thing. I said, well, today, if people want to see God, we are that tabernacle. We are part of that one body. So one church, and he is the head of that body. So therefore, if people want to see God today, we can reflect his life. And that takes us back mm -hmm. to this whole thing. You know, he is the light. And basically, uh, we, we need to be mere reflections of him. We need to be imitators of him. I don't know if that makes much sense or if that fits, to, fits together. But that's the way I went with it when I, when I read that word tent and then the tabernacle. And I know we are living stones. And if you, mm -hmm. if uh, someone wants to see God today, they, you need to let them see him through you and through the way that you're living and the way you treat everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's great. That's, even, that's I, great. I'll tell you, I've really enjoyed these, this little, I really enjoyed this one verse. It was really so much packed in that one little verse. You wouldn't oh, definitely. That. And you said there's a lot there to uh, unpack, and it really, really is. Um, Jesus was the tabernacle then. Today, we are that tabernacle today. Yeah. And, yeah. And that's what Peter said in Second Peter 1 when he says that the Lord shows how to put off our tabernacle. Yeah. Yeah. And he even uses the word tabernacle there um, in Second Peter 1, I think it's verse 18. But, um, but anyway, um, you know, and then you have other verses that go along the lines of, you know, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1, that we have a, you know, our earth habitation will be put away for the eternal. That's me paraphrasing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, you know, but, so, yeah, and, and, and the tabernacle is meant to be moved. It was never meant to be the permanent one. It was meant to be, you know, which I find that, also interesting because Jesus, uh, you know, from what we know about, you know, him in the Gospels is he never had a place to lay his head. That's right. That's right. Um, and so he always moved around. And, right. um, you know, and um, there, there's a lot of interesting stuff there. And, um, and there's a lot of similarities between Jesus and Moses Jesus and Elijah and Jesus and David. Uh, now, there's some lessons between him and, and most others, but I feel like those are like the three real, to me, very prominent things that you just see constantly throughout his ministry uh, more than others. Um, you know, but I mean, also you see Christ in all of the uh, you know, Old Testament. Uh, types and shadows and the people and the characters and the, you know all, all of that but uh, it is interesting there and I was reading today in fact uh, this as an example that in Deuteronomy um, 32 where it uses the word um, that Jesus that, that Moses was praying on the mountain and he was saying that uh, you no know, to the final prayer to Israel, he's saying that this is the that uh, you know blesses the king of Jeshurun. Okay. I'm like, well, what does that mean? So, so Jeshurun is a poetic term that refers to Israel. Mm. It's only used three or four different times in the Bible. Uh, two times, I think it is in Deuteronomy 32 and 33. And it's interesting then that it means beloved or, or the beloved one. So he's saying, you know, this is the king, the beloved one. And then you look at Ephesians 1 verse 6. And the same word as you mentioned in, in the Septuagint there, 
uh, which is a Greek translation of the Hebrew, um, uses the same word to talk about Jesus there, as he's the king of the beloved. And, and in that verse in Ephesians 1, verse 6, it says he is the beloved one. And so to me, even from that standpoint, um, you know, there's a lot of things. That he's, he's meant to be, um, he's meant to really show who Israel should have been. And now we have the church as the new spiritual Israel, there from Galatians 6. You know, he's, you know, it's interesting then that from the standpoint of Moses and traveling, Moses traveled all the time, um, you know, because he, he couldn't go to the promised land. Uh, David traveled all the time because he was always hiding and fleeing and, and fighting somebody over here or there. And so he always moved around a good bit. And Elijah did the same thing. He's always traveling around and stuff. And it's interesting then that when you look at Jesus, uh, is that it seems as though he's just kind of showing the world that you know these prophets. You know, you know all this. And Christ is like, he's coming down and he's redeeming all of those things that they've always thought about and all that. He said, now I'm going to show you what you really have to do and what it really looks like to be the actual redeemer. And I'm going to redeem all of these things that have happened and all of these, uh, you know, little things here or there. Uh, and, and just uh, as an example, in Second Samuel 8, uh, I want to say it's, my verse left, I want to say it's 14, where it says that, um, this is just one one off um, that uh, says that uh, David made a name for himself when he when he killed eighteen thousand Syrians in the Valley of Salt. Great, good for him. What does that have to do with anything? Well, it's interesting that if you go to Matthew um, four. Verse 24, it says that all of Syria came out to be healed by Jesus. And so I think it's interesting there that in 2 Samuel 8, where it says 18,000 Syrians died at the hand of David, now you have Jesus, who is a descendant of David, the Lord of David, who's now going to go out, and his, and his fame, it says, went throughout all of Syria. And then they brought those who were sick and diseased and demon-possessed to Jesus. And then after that, then you see that then his fame spread throughout all of the rest of the region there, around Jerusalem, Judea, and uh, Samaria and things. But I found that it's interesting that even that whole, that, even that, that little bitty thing shows that he was always just redeeming all kind of, all kind of things. Um, now, even in the, sm the smallest, minutest detail, he's redeeming something, someone, somehow in the old law. Or, uh, for us today to really realize this is how powerful he is. This is how, you know, this is why he's meant to be here. He's not some accident just kind of showed up. Yeah. Uh, you know, not plan, not plan B, huh? Yeah, you know, and, 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 and his whole life is all about just redeeming everything. I'm going to be the Redeemer. And so I, and I think this verse really emphasizes that really strongly. Man, that's a lot. That's a lot. That's pretty neat. What was that word? What was the word? Gershon? Gershon, you said? Jeshurun. Jeshurun. I'm going to look that up. I'll yeah, like J-E-S-H-U-R-U-N. I'm going to look that up. I like that. I really like that. Uh I need to be better with my Old Testament stuff, but uh, <laughs> I'm getting a little better. But ah, that's all right. I really, I, I like that. Uh, you, and you've already talked about uh, the glory and it being associated uh, the, the glory. I mean, um, and again, it glory was always associated with the tabernacle. You know, in in the Old Testament, you know, that's where God was. He, that's where you seen His glory. Um, his dwelling. Um, I 
lost my place. Oh, okay. The only other thing I've been, they said John uses the word glory than any other gospel writer there is. Mm -hmm. So, yes. you just think that glory in our sense, you know, he, he was really emphasized, emphasizing the glory of God. And you really mm -hmm. talk, or Jesus, and you really talk about that here, really his glory, uh, him being a redeemer. That, you know, that's, you know, that's glorious there if you think about it. Right, yes, yes. And, and it's all pointing to the cross where that's the ultimate uh, time when his glory is on full display is at the cross. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, you have John 2, verse 11, which talks about the first miracle there, which says is the manifestation of his glory. But you really see his glorification happen at the cross and at his uh, resurrection. Now we yeah. see, and even at the cross, because, you know, there was a lot of stuff that happened at the cross. And it was there when that centurion said, truly this was the Son of God. Now that man, when he said that, he admitted that Jesus had glory. Now that was a blasphemous statement that the Roman centurion made because he could say because only, the, only the, uh, the Caesars had that. And so it's interesting then that, that all through the life of Jesus, he's constantly showing glory. And now at his death, everyone now sees, oh, he really is who he says he is. He, all of this now makes sense at the cross. And so, um, you know, and, 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 you know, when you look at glory, there's a lot of stuff there. You know, glory measures us, you know, for all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 2.23. You know, glory uh, is what you and I, uh, strive to live in in the end. You know, heaven's called the place of glory, and so, uh, you know, I mean, there, there's, there's quite a lot of stuff, uh, material dealing with that in Scripture. That um, you can just go into that for days and have a good good say with that by itself. I know, man. That's what I said. You know, we we've been talking about trying to you know, keep these about thirty minute videos, but Lord, I mean, we. Yeah, we could talk so much just on that, that one verse. It, there's just so much there, so much. Um, who who else is uh, refer, I mean, we've talked about this before as the only begotten in Scripture? As Isaac. As Isaac. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. right. Some people. Uh, I, I didn't know that really until uh, I've done this. I followed that study on the pre-incarnate. Okay. Of Christ and whatnot, and I never knew. Uh, that Isaac was called the only begotten. Also, I never knew that. And mm. and again, that kind of t that um, you know, looking back in the Old Testament, you know, really, you know, that's Isaac was a shadow. You probably kind of hit you know, a shadow of Jesus. Uh, there's a lot of similarities of Isaac there and are. Jesus. Uh, lots of them. I I meant to have a list and I didn't get it. I couldn't find <laughs> it. But uh, I know the one that. It's really fascinating. Well, it's obvious. Uh, the only begotten, and then also um, he was going to. Well, in Abraham's mind, he was dead for three days. Th that journey, correct? You know, uh, in his mind, he was dead for three days. Jesus was dead for three days, uh, and also, um, what was the other one? Subst a substitutionary. Yes. Um, you know, they had, he had the realm. Christ is our substitute. That's right. Um, Another neat thing. Do you think uh, Abraham knew when he was telling Isaac, God will provide us with a sacrifice? Do you think Abraham knew that he was speaking prophecy? Uh, I don't think. Uh, I would say no. I would say that he had faith that God would take care of him because you know he was already told that through you you're gonna have you know many nations and and Genesis 12 there now you have your only son and and even in Genesis 22 there he really emphasizes you know you're one only beloved son. Yeah. Uh, he really strongly you know you're one you're only you're beloved <laughs> you're this is, you're this is your boy. Uh, he really emphasizes that a lot in uh, Genesis 22, 1 through 11 there, or 1 through 14, rather. Um, but, uh, but it, it, yeah, there's, there's a good bit of stuff there. Um, 
You, you oh. can think about, uh, you know, Isaac, because Isaac was not just some boy. I mean, no, he, he, he probably was um, a young man uh, as I've well. Some, and so, some, some commentators I've read, they think that he was probably about 33 years old because okay. of people. Now they just they assume that because Christ was around thirty. Correct. Uh, yeah, that's I've I've not seen that one. Uh, I've seen a lot that say he's probably in his upper teens and twenties. Yeah. Um. So, but but you know, the, and that's another thing that's interesting here is that he willingly went, um, you know, on, on the altar. Um. Dad and, and and Christ willingly went. Yeah. You know, so you see that. It's, is there a scripture that shows says that he willingly went to the altar of Isaac? Uh, not in that phrase, but he he was he was gonna go. Okay. I mean, like you uh, just read it, he's gonna go. We uh we kind of talked about this a little bit, me and Dad. And Dad says, well, you know, we don't know how old he is, but we do know that he had to be at least a, a strong, uh, young and or young mm-hmm. man because he toted the wood. Yes, he toted, right. He toted the wood for the sacrifice. You know, that that made the point. How much wood do you think it would take to burn a, a animal? That's mm-hmm. a lot of wood that boy was toting. So oh yeah. He, he wasn't a little. He wasn't a little child. He was a. Mm-hmm. He was at least an adolescent, you know, young man. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, even even that side, now he he's carrying his own wood. Christ yeah. carried his own wood too. Oh yeah, look at there. That's a good yeah. One. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff right there. It's very interesting. See, that's what I was talking about. I want to do that little thing with other preachers. See? <laughs> that's good. That's, that's good. Yeah. yeah. That's good stuff. But, but, but yeah, there, there's a lot of stuff there. You can, um, I mean, you know, I've... Um, Mariah. Yeah. That was on the map. Mariah. Where was, where was the tabernacle built? Mariah. Or, I mean, uh, Jerusalem. Oh, Mariah. yeah. Yeah, well, yeah that, that's the, that's the yeah. same place. Yeah. 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 That, yeah. Yeah, Mariah is the same place, um, and, and both of them are outside of. Obviously, Jerusalem isn't there yet as they would have it. Yeah. Um, and so it's on the outside there. Christ is uh, uh, on the cross on the outside of the city. Um, you know, all, all kind of similarities there if you really want to go down into it. I've got us off topic with the only begotten. I'm sorry. No, it's on. It's it's <laughs> on topic. Uh, it's it's all good, but um, but the the term only begotten though, uh, in the New Testament only refers to Jesus. Yes. Yeah, but well, Isaac on. was on the old law, and 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 you're thinking about Hebrews eleven fifteen to seventeen there. Okay. The boy says that he was dead already. Um, yes, yes. Yeah, yes, so, so that, that's yeah. that's all right there in Hebrews 11, where it says, yeah. by faith, Abraham offered him up being dead already. And you can go and read that. But That was a that was a good study. I've done that one time with Abraham. Um, do that, and I was like, man, that's so, that's so crazy, isn't it? Because, you know, you think about the faith of Abraham, it's not like God told him and he just had to go outside and, and they done it right there. He literally had to travel mm-hmm. three days with this on his mind. Ah, yeah, yeah. All right, verse fifteen. Thirty minutes away. Let's go. <laughs> well, the rest of you know, the re- I don't have a whole lot. Really okay. I feel bad, but you know, the really the rest of it's kind of. Um, I, I don't know. Let's, let's go. Verse fifteen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me, after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Again, John saying, I am a witness. I'm a witness of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, and I think a lot of people get thrown throw off with this. When, you know, he comes after me. Well, John the Baptist was born first. All right? I mean, they was, uh, what, first cousins? Cousins? Or yeah. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he comes after me. But then John says he was before me. They, you know, some people try to say, oh, that's a contradiction, but it's not. 
it's just basically showing us again that Jesus is deity and John is right. just a mere man. That's what I have on that one. Uh, do you have anything on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, just what you're already saying. He, he already knew that he was preexistent. He knew he was already special from the beginning. Um, you know, and he even, even when he was in jail, Matthew 11 there, uh, at Herod, he even sent his own people to Jesus saying, you the Christ, and Christ sent back and says, you know, you know who I am. And so uh, it's interesting there that even that he, he always recognized Jesus as the Christ, even at his uh, weakest moment. But I, I think Matthew 11 is him dealing with um, reassurance myself, but yeah. uh, more so. But and, and Christ reassures him again, saying, you know, you've already done this, and you know what's happening. Um, and so it's, it's interesting. But this is the first witness here, um, you know, dealing, because, you know, in order to prove, so in order to not be classified as a blasphemer, you have to have witnesses to prove who you say you are. Yeah. And so this is the first one that's going to be brought in. Uh, is John. It says we're born on witness, and then those going to be more what's going to say, God bears me witness, or the Spirit bears witness of me, or the Word does, or my works, my miracles, and this kind of thing. It all has that little phrase, bear witness. And so this is the first one. Uh, it's going to yeah. establish Jesus' deity while he's on the earth and to make sure that they understand this is, this is who he is. I didn't think about that. That's true. He was the first witness. Yeah. The law, you know, they had to have two. That's a good point there. Good point. Yeah. Well, he, and I think he had, um, do you have seven? I think he had seven. Yes. I didn't uh, look at that. Think, I know you mentioned that the other day. Yeah. Um, look, I'll spend more time looking for him. Uh, I know. Get, it's okay. But yeah, I think there are seven witnesses or seven times he mentioned the witness. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which John only, uses the, he uses that seven, you know. He, he does it a lot. Mm. Uh, I think in the next chapter, well, well during all this, really, um, I kind of haven't gotten into it. You know, really, he, he does the first week of Jesus, basically, in these uh, first seven days of his little ministry here. And they said that kind of, it might be a John trying to get you back to think of creation in seven days or something other. I, I I'd have to really read that again, but yeah, I haven't right, read it right. enough. Well, right. Um, John, well, all the Gospels use mainly two numbers, seven and three. Uh, uh, there are other numbers there, like Matthew 1, how those 40 generations between David and 40 generations yeah. between, you know, but that's still a derivative of seven. Uh, yeah. So, uh, but a, a, anyway, anyway, that's beside the point. Um, but But that's... Two of the most common numbers you'll see is seven and three. Hmm. You know, the death, yeah. burial, and resurrection, that's three. Uh, I said that's three, and I raised four fingers. That's three. <laughs> uh, you know, his intentions is number four. But, um, you know, the, the Godhead, three, you know, God, Father, Spirit, and the Son, or, uh, you know, yeah. uh, got out of order there. But anyway, um, you know, but that, and there, there's quite a lot of that. And then the sevens, you know, John emphasizes the sevens a good bit, uh, which we, which we'll get there as we go. If you want a good if you want a good sermon on walking by faith, not by sight, do it on John the Baptist's father and Mary, Jesus's mother. When they yes. Both about being a, uh, pregnant. Yes. Yes, and um, also, yes, and I actually I, I read a thing about that last week, and it was really really good. And and, and the guy I was reading um, was showing the similarities between uh, Zechariah and Mary, and how he questioned and she didn't. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and, and he'd been and he'd been praying. He'd been praying, right? He'd yeah, praying. And, you know, that goes on, you know, have you, uh, you know, that shows you the importance of praying with faith, praying with the, you know, we're not supposed to pray with the doubt. We're supposed to pray, uh, 
I guess, yeah, with faith, knowing that he, he can do all this stuff that we're asking for. Um, right, right. But yeah. Right. Yeah, that is an interesting study there. That right. is good. Let's go to 16 then. <laughs> Okay, it says, for of his fullness we all received grace for grace. Here's a fun phrase, grace for grace. Yeah, I got just, you know, verse 14 says, says that Christ is full of grace. Um, meaning that the grace that Christ gives, was what I'm getting here, the grace that Christ gives, it does not run out. It, it does not expire. You know, it's always going to be there for us. Well, until judgment, uh, you know, judgment comes, that grace is going to be, uh, for the unfaithful, it'll be cut off. Mm -hmm. um, but his grace is full of faith and love. That's 1 Timothy 1.14. Uh, so, but I, I don't know if I'm explaining that grace for grace right or to the uh, well enough. But that's what I can, you know, his grace doesn't expire, doesn't run out. It's full of faith and love. Do you have anything else on that? Sounds good to me. The only thing I do want to mention is that people take, today, people take, um, that grace, um, they just keep that you know oh it's you know it's, it's never ending it never expires you know he, he's full of grace his grace is always here right mm -hmm. but they keep living in sin they take yeah. advantage of that grace i guess that's that's yeah. what i'm trying to yeah yeah, trying to, yeah. Uh, they take advantage of that face they they think they think just keep you know keep getting it keep getting it keep getting it get uh, more and more and more you know uh romans uh, romans one romans six one through two talks a lot about that yes it does uh, I think people take advantage of God's grace. They, I mean, mm -hmm. it's free for all, but people take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, they do. Uh, I do want to make a comment about this uh, verse real quick. Okay. Um, so the verse reads, For of his fullness we all receive grace for grace. Uh, it's been suggested by interpreters that this may be more accurately translated as grace upon grace yep. which leans toward the riches of Jesus um, and also we have abundant grace but also this verse is dealing with uh, as as a, a man named Woost says for he had nothing for we had nothing but Christ came as a fullness of deity. And then he's hinting there at Colossians 2, 9, for the fullness we all received, as in we all received, as in, you know, Christ gave us his all, uh, you know, his all of Christ, all of his deity came down and dwelt. Uh, he didn't keep anything back from us. He gave everything. Uh, I've always uh, said the fact that Jesus is grace. Jesus is grace. Um, yeah. Uh, um, well, you have the you have the the cross there about uh, God's riches at Christ's expense. The grace, the grace, and you know, you have you have the cross, you know, G R A C, uh, God's yeah. riches at Christ's expense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I got you. Yeah. Yeah. I I tried to. Uh, I'd have to remember all the verses I had set up to prove that Christ was actually grace. But there's one text that I heard you if you read it, it don't make it just like Christ and then Christ. It don't it don't, it don't line up, but anyways, I, I I you know Christ, Jesus was grace. Um, I forget the verse that says that they we seen we seen God's grace. We seen it. Mm -hmm. They seen Jesus. I mean, they yeah. seen they seen that grace. They seen it. Uh, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Okay. But I know. I, I know. There's more to grace than just Christ. You got the mercy and love and all that. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. yeah, I'm about to work on that some too. <laughs> <laughs> we all have things to work on. Uh, yeah. All right, so verse 17 says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through or came by Jesus Christ. Um, 
Yeah, quite a lot there too. Uh, the yeah. law was given through Moses. Um, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. This is the first time you see anyone from the Old Testament mentioned. John is Moses. Um, Jesus mentioned earlier. You know, he's going to um, kind of be the new Moses in a sense. Um, I feel like you get that more from Matthew's account than you do from John. Because Matthew, his whole gospel seems to be written really based on... Uh, well, one of the ways you can look at it is Matthew is centered on the speeches of Jesus. Whereas John is centered on more of like a public setting, a private setting, a public setting. Kind of like an accordion on public yeah. and private. Um, so you, a little bit different there in, in how they're... Um, both kind of set up, but uh, it is interesting there that Jesus, you know, uh, is going to come in and, and kind of be the new lawgiver, uh, which that's going to be constant throughout the gospel accounts. And John emphasizes this the most, uh, I think, for the idea of that. There's and I, it, and to me, he's really he's really laying the foundation here for this for the the book because the main. Uh, culprits of the whole thing are Jews and it says that you know that there are some Jews who sit on the seat of Moses and they are the ones that's going to pass condemnation upon Jesus whereas right here you see Jesus is coming in and he's going to be the new lawgiver who's going to bring in grace and truth and uh, so you see quite a uh, you know, quite a bit of that going on Go ahead. Now, I do have a, I do have a question. You don't have to answer it now. You can answer it. Send it to me a text now. What about Noah? Okay. Noah found grace in God's eyes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, I, I, I just want to have a good explanation of how the strain knows the uh, explain. I said strain. Explain. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. You know, what about Noah? How was that grace delivered to Noah? Um, how, how would you go about explaining that? Well, that would be uh, second, First Peter 3, um, 18 to 20, where you have the phrase that the spirits, uh, that uh, the gospel is preached to the spirits in prison back in the time of Noah. That's me paraphrasing entirely. Uh, yes. And so back in the times of Noah then, Noah saw Jesus um, because Noah was inspired. He was an inspired individual. You know, he got the the plans for the ark from God Himself. Yes. Um, and, and First Peter and Ezekiel. And in fact, in Ezekiel fourteen, verse fourteen, it says that Noah is uh, is my son. Hey, boy, is classified as a preacher of righteousness yes in first peter 2 5 there um Hi. hey kevin who's this this is alex hey, yeah. okay <laughs> there he goes but um and so obviously then there's a lot of stuff there uh that that noah um was looking toward the messiah even even in i think even when he's building the ark he understood hey no no please don't do that baby uh, he understood that there was to be a place of safety and security and refuge. Now yeah. that was the ark, but I think that there was some foreshadowing there with being in Jesus inside of the church as well. So, um, another thing: where where was God when He told Noah, you know, Noah, come into the ark? You know, God was in the ark with him. Right, 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 right. I, I There's a lot. Curious, of, you know, yeah. um, I've done a sermon a few weeks back on, but you know. Grace and Noah, and I, I was just kind of curious. I didn't. I was. I didn't know. If maybe there was a uh, a pre-incarnate way, or you know, put Christ there exactly, like in, just, in the text. And I just didn't catch it. Didn't see it. Uh, I was just curious. But then again, I would also would it be all right to say that that's just another way to show that Jesus Christ is deity because He offers that grace, the same grace that was offered to Noah, Christ is offering that to you today, too. Correct. 
and yes. in truth. Yeah. Well, but grace and truth and Jesus' word, you know, the word is, is truth. So mm -hmm. God's word is truth. He done, I mean, I don't, know, I don't know if that's the way we can look at it all. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, well, you know, grace is always there, but how do you obtain grace? We have to follow the instructions. And so Noah had grace. He found grace, and I was a God. Genesis six, verse six, there, yeah. or five and six, there. But he had to still. It wasn't enough. He had to still build the ark. He moved with a godly fear. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, you know, same <laughs> thing. You know, even though you, even though it's present, you have to still do something to. To live in the grace. That's right. Got to yep. He preached righteousness, and Noah done works of righteousness. Yeah. Being yeah. That girl. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, where are we at? Verse eighteen. We finally made it to where. Oh, uh, by the way, the uh, Pharisees. I found my verse here. It's in my, it's in my oh. notes. It's on down. Uh, are said to sit in Moses' seat. Matthew 23, verse 2 is where that is. 23, verse 2. Yep, that's where it says the scribes and the Pharisees sat in the seat of Moses and another ones that were more often not the ones that were condemning Jesus. Uh, so I mentioned that earlier, found the verse. Now let's go on. Thank you. Verse 18, no man, and this verse, oh, this, this verse here almost got me, and, well, it did, me and my wife uh, in an argument, uh, discussion, <laughs> I would say. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared. I mean, there's plenty of scriptures that, in the Old Testament, that says uh, people seen God, right? Okay. Moses. Hey, uh, me. Uh, was it Moses and Aaron and a few of the other ones that went up? They said they seen him. I've just tried to explain that they didn't really see uh, see God. Mm -hmm. They seen maybe uh, parts of his glory mm -hmm. uh, and whatnot. They didn't actually see him. And in the and in the Old Testament, if there's anyone that said that they seen God, I, it was in a reference to the pre-incarnate. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, I think that's who was walking with Adam and Eve in the garden. I think it was the pre pre-incarnate Christ. Uh, I think in the other places where, like Moses, for instance, you know, he didn't really see the full glory of God. He just seen an essence, you know, something of God. Right. And in this commentary I'm reading, he says you know, it, it would have made a big, big difference if the definite article would have been here with, it would have said, no man has seen the God, like God the Father. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, okay. That's how he explained it. Do you have anything on that? Okay. Yeah, I got a few things. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, let's see. Well, you got a few things here. Uh, I also have a few questions that I have my notes. I'll just read them out because that makes sense to me. Yeah, Does this verse contradict Exodus 24, verse 10, where it says, Saul, God of Israel? Or is this a contradiction of Job 42, verse 5, where Job said of God, Now mine eyes seeth thee. This verse is saying that they have seen certain... Uh, Manifestation, manifestations of God. There we go. But no one has actually literally seen the only invisible, eternal God, who is a spirit. John five thirty seven. The Father Himself, who sent me, has testified of me. You have neither heard His voice at any time, nor seen His uh, form or outward appearance. Job, uh, Job. John six forty six says not, not that anyone has seen the Father except He who is from God has seen the Father. And so Jesus did and is responsible for the faithful representation of God among humanity. And that's the phrase that he comes from the bosom of the Father, what suggests that he is the one that has the uh, most intimate and closest uh, fellowship with God as a state of existence. There you go. Um. 
And how does God, how do people see God today? I try to tell my girls that all the time, like, you know, if you want to show somebody God or what a Christian is, ever how you want to word it, God, uh, people see God today through us. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I got a few more things. I'll just really quick jump in, if you don't mind. It says uh, Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, Christ is the express image of God. That's the actual stamp or the actual print of God. And uh, he brought us the demonstration of not only who God is, but what God is. Uh, and as a side note, in my notes here, uh, there are some similarities between Christ and God's Word. Uh, Christ was both human and divine. The Bible is human and divine. Christ is uh, of the Jews. The Bible is majority of the Jews. Uh, both show the will of God. Uh, both were disbelieved, mocked, and tried in false trials and crucified. Same with the Bible. And both Christ and the Bible have triumphed over death. That's pretty neat. Yeah, got that. I like that. I like that. And if, if anybody's wondering what that loud noise was while Steve was trying to finish up there, that is my coffee pot, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's ready. <laughs> I know. He was sitting there talking. I'm sitting there off in my head. I'm like, I hope they can hear him. Oh, this coffee pot is so loud. Oh, no. Well, you, I have a little person in my room, too, so it's okay. Yeah, it's all right, though. I, yeah. Again, I think it just shows that, man, we're just, uh, we're just, we're just trying to study God's Word. I think there's been a lot said today, a lot of good things, a lot of good, uh, not rabbit holes, as I, I tend to call them, but kind of off subject, but you are on subject. Lots and lots of good things. Um, I've enjoyed these first 18 verses so much. So, so, so much. Yeah, yeah. It's qu- quite a lot in there. Quite a good bit. Good, A lot of good stuff. And we didn't even touch half of it. I know. <laughs> we only uh-huh. hit the highlights and just kind of go on. You know, when we first really started this, I, I had plans of uh, having like two or three different commentary. Uh, looking at all kinds of stuff, but it's like, man... You know, you, you can't say it all. We can't say it all. So I just, I really like that one commentary I got here. So I'm just going to try to stick with it. And <laughs> there you go. Not look for, yeah. Yeah. Not look for too many more outside sources than what I have right here in front of me. Just keep this and go with that. So I don't There you go. So much stuff. Because, man, there, there's a lot more that we could talk about. We could talk about grace all day. Oh, we yeah. Could talk about how the tabernacle and us, the church, all day. Mm-hmm. We could, I could could have went to a whole lot more stuff, but I oh, yeah. really, I've enjoyed this. I really have. Oh, yeah. 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 So I suppose next week then we'll do um, 19. Let me go down and see what we got here. 19 through, um, what do we think, 20? Ooh. I was thinking about probably about 34. Okay. Let's, let's go for that. And we'll just do a big old snapshot of the thing. Yeah, because that's really, um, uh, it's more about, uh, John and then back and forth. Yeah, I think, I think, I know it's a lot of verses, but, uh, okay. can, if I don't get us uh, off subject too much. No, no, no. But, uh, as a, um, way to look forward in this thing um next week uh we're going to bring up again the seven days of john one one and two yes that's coming up so you want to be here to see what that's all about well i'm glad we were able to do this i'm trying to i'm trying to get my thing where i can make a Mark for where I'm, where we're at next next week. So we're doing nineteen and thirty four. You saying? Yes. All right. Sounds good to me. 
And I'm glad everybody has joined us again. I hope y'all are enjoying this as much as me and Stephen are. I'm enjoying it, you know, just getting to talk with Stephen and, and <laughs> pick his brain a little bit. Well, wow. Learn from him. Um, but like I, I've, I've said on the last videos, you know, get your Bibles out. Uh, read them. Study them. Uh, get you a good set of commentaries. A good set of commentaries go a long way. Uh, there's a lot of free commentaries online, but, you know, get you a good set of commentaries and, and stick with them and read them. And, and now be careful with them and uh, compare them to the Bible. But read your Bible. Study your Bible. Yep. Yep. And if it helps to have someone else to... He's done a lot more study to help you out. Um, you know, I definitely say, uh, you know, the, the general rule of thumb uh, with that is, you know, you read the Bible, then you reread it, and then you reread it. And one of the things that uh, I've always uh, enjoyed doing is when you find a text that you really want to dive into, you do, um, you really... Uh, you know, line up 20 observations or facts about, you know, that text, however many verses it is, whatever. And to me, the first 10 are very easy to get. You know, you're pretty much like this going, we quote the text, essentially, kind of get all your facts straightened up. But then if you want to get your 20, you really got to uh, really begin to look at it. Yes. And as, as, as you go down the list, you have to go deeper and deeper. Um and then now you're really studying, now you're really beginning to, I feel like, really meditate on what's really being said or what's happening or, you know, whatever's, you know, whatever you're studying. Um, you know, you look at all of the kind of languages you use and, you know, figurative or narrative or history or whatever, you know, the culture and stuff. And so you really begin to look at stuff a lot deeper, uh, I think, when, when you really take the effort to really, you know, try to do 20 observations from the text. It's, it's really good. Well, so, that's part of um, hermeneutics, ain't it? You know, when yes, you first start, start that, you know, read it, read it over and over and over again, just about what you can memorize it here. Right, right. Um, well, um, yeah, right, 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 right. And hermeneutics, uh, for those yeah. who don't know what that means, means the science of interpretation. Yes. Because it comes from Hermes, or Hermes, who was the interpreter for the gods and mythology. And so it's a Greek word. And a lot of Greek words um, are, are, in fact, the names of gods. And so there's a lot of extra stories behind them, too, uh, just as an aside. But anyway, uh, yeah. we're not ascribing to Greek gods. Or that. It's just an extra thing there. But, um, you know, it is interesting. But uh, and, and a lot of guys, a lot of people say, you know, about the observation deal that you can do 15. Uh, but I, I found 20 begins to really get you down there. I feel like the first 10 to 12, uh, I feel like it's pretty pretty easy easy money. Uh, I feel like you, once you get about 15, 16, you begin to really look at a lot more stuff. I've, I've, I've learned to tell the kids and you know, myself, just don't speed read. You're not reading, you know, I hate that, you know, read the Bible, in, you know, seven days and, or something like, you know, read the whole Bible in one year, whatever. I, I, I don't like that. Uh, take your time, read the same chapter, same set of scriptures two or three times because you're going to miss so much. Yeah. It, realize how my mind was blown when I realized that there was, oh, uh, <laughs> we did you know, the three, how many wise men was there at Jesus' birth? 75. Yeah, but you get them saying none. They wasn't there. They wasn't there. No, no, they, they came later. Yeah. He was, what, six three. months old? Yeah, and it wasn't three. We yeah. don't know. It just says yeah. they, that wise men, and we just assumed three because they brought it. Anyways, read your Bible. Yeah. Know that now, yeah. And you'll pick up some of the stuff that you just missed, some of these you might get 20 details uh, a lot faster if you read it and read it and read it slow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think the last time we closed, we talked about prayer. 
um, you know, an important thing for everybody to pray, 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 pray. It's the one thing that we do not use a tool belt, a tool in our tool belt that we don't use a lot. Pray more. Uh, my other, another word of advice for this week would be to uh, worship in spirit. I worship with the with the right heart. You know, with the right mindset. Worship in mm-hmm. worship in truth. Try to do that a little bit better this week during worship services. Sure. It's a hard definitely. thing. It's a hard thing to do sometimes. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Yeah, no, I think we've had a good study. Uh, so we appreciate everyone watching it and listening to it and following along with us and uh, looking up our verses we couldn't give quotes for. Uh, that's a good thing to do all the time. Look up your references. But uh, good study time for that too. But anyway, uh, we appreciate that. And if you have any questions, uh, you'll see an email pop up here on the on the video. And uh, email us or comment on the video. And uh, also we, again, have uh, uh, a Facebook page you can go to and interact with us there as well. Uh, we're always up for any discussion, uh, healthy or otherwise. And so always feel free to ask as many um, things as you want to ask, questions, concerns, whatever. Hey, how to keep a kid quiet. That'd be great. <laughs> but uh, during the video, he's having fun playing playing the cars. Anyways, but that's all I got. Do uh, you have anything else you want to add as we close? Nothing else? Guys, if y'all, I mean, again, we're just two regular old Joes here. Just um, if y'all need help studying, we're here. If you have uh, questions about where you are going or attending church and just uh, you know, have questions about that, just reach out to us because always um, remember if your church where you're attending where you're going to church and I use that loosely church uh, if, you know, if it doesn't have the markers that are found in the Bible of what Jesus' church is you know really Give us a shout, and we can help you uh, see the true church. And you know, if you if what you're doing doesn't line up with what the Bible says, we can help you out in any way that we can. Um, even even if you're in another state, I'm in Mississippi, Stevens in Texas. I'm pretty sure we can uh, help you out. We can we can get you somewhere to show you uh, the true church. That's all I got, man. Sounds great, man. Well, uh, we'll we'll stop it here. But we just want to wish everyone a great rest of your day and a good rest of your week. And we'll see you back here next Friday, Lord willing, if the creek don't rise. And uh, if you make it back, we'd love to have you. Hope you have a good rest of your day. We'll see you around. See you next week. All right.